we get back today in Thessalonians, starting a new year, Paul. We're going to finish this book, going into another book here coming soon, because this is, we're on the last chapter of both books here. Uh, but Second Thessalonians chapter two, starting in verse thirteen. Remember a little recap of what's happening here. Paul is having to uh, encourage this church because of a letter or a prophecy or something that happened that kind of threw them off and got them really discouraged. They thought they'd missed the rapture. They thought they'd missed a number of things and were worried about those who had died if, if they were going to experience the rapture. And Paul had to come back in and tell them. Actually, he told him, he says, look, I've already explained this to you once before back in chapter 2 of this, this book here. He said, I've explained this to you once before, but let's go over it again. So he starts going over again what, what takes place, what will take place on that great and glorious day. And we, look, and we look forward with anticipation to that day happening because we could be alive. We could be the last generation that walks upon this earth that sees him coming in the clouds. Amen. It could happen any day. We know that. We've been saying that for 2,000 something years. But look, folks, it's the, the earth is ready. The world is ready for this to take place even right now as I'm speaking. Things have taken place. Prophecies have come true. Everything is lined up and ready to go. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be another 50 years down the road. I don't know. Just get ready. Amen, church? Be ready any moment for this to take place. And Paul is reassuring these folks at Thessalonica that it has not yet taken place. To take heart. They did not miss it. God's in control of things. And to listen to his teachings and his teachings only, not these outside teachings that are coming in trying to destroy what Paul did. As we know, studying the book of Acts, Paul had Judaizers coming behind him, the Jewish men coming behind him after every town he dropped off in and telling them the good news. And they turn right around and say, oh, no, you got to do this, this, and this in order to get saved. No, you got to be a Jew for it. You got to do this. You got to get circumcised. You gotta... They were always downplaying, if you will, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which Paul put out there to the Gentiles and says, no, all you have to do is what? Believe. That's it. There's no transference of membership, no this, no that, no transference of anything. It's just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So he's reassuring the Thessalonians here today. As a matter of fact, he's going to reassure them in a way that some people have taken to be a theology that uh, kind of messes up how we get saved. <laughs> and so we're going to look at some of that this morning. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. <clears throat> this is what he says. He said, but we ought to always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through a sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word or mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And we'll stop right there. Now, when you see a verse like that starts out with but or because or therefore, you got to look backwards a little bit and see what he's talking about, right? So verse 13 starts with a, a, a but. We encourage you. We ought to th always thank God. Why is he saying that? If you back up to verse 9, you'll see what has just been spoken before this. In verse 9, it says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance to the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion that they will believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned and have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. And then he says, But we thank God. God for y'all because you got saved. That's where verse 13 comes in with that but God says. I love any time that we are explain, explaining something and we're trying to explain something that that word will come up but God did this. But God stepped in did this, right? Uh, in that while we were yet sinners running from God, but God stepped in and saved us, didn't he? He saved. He came after us. And so we realize that God makes the initiative here. In this area of salvation, <clears throat> we need to understand. Now, in this verse 13, we're not condemned as the followers of the Antichrist are being condemned, but we're going to be thankful that God has saved us. God has chosen us. Now, if I stop that verse, if we read 13 again, and I said, brothers, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved and stop it right there, 
then guess what? <laughs> you, can, you can lean on predestination all you want to then say, yep, see there, I told you, God saved some and he, he, he created some, go straight to hell. No, God didn't create any human being for hell. We need to understand that, all right? It's not double predestination here. God has chosen, matter of fact, he says in these verses, God even chose you, talking to First Church Thessalonians here, he said, God chose you before in the beginning of time. Whoa, wait, whoa, wait, way, way, way back then? We were already chosen for salvation way back then? Really? God chose you for salvation before the beginning of time? He did the first church of Thessalonica here. He, did he choose you before the beginning of time? God knows, we, ha we know him as omnipresent, omnipotent. Uh, he knows everything. He knows how it's going to work out. But in salvation, we need to understand God offers it to everybody. But not everybody is going to what? Receive it, are they? Not everybody is going to receive it. How did he choose us to salvation? Don't stop that verse after that word. Don't say he chose you to be saved. Go ahead. Through what? The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And through belief in the truth. You know what that just said? The Holy Spirit has to what? Draw you to salvation and you have to what? Believe. God's got a part. You got a part. God's got it all figured out, but you have to believe. You have to believe. That is his, that's his foundation. That's the way he laid out save it, salvation for us. The Holy Spirit draws us. Jesus said, unless, unless you are drawn to the Father, you can't come to the Father. Unless you come through me, you can't come to the You're drawn by the Holy Spirit to God. Everybody in this room that got saved, has been saved, you had to be drawn by the Holy Spirit to believe. You know why? You had to be woke up, didn't you? Not, not that they, today's definition of that, but you had to get awakened by the Spirit. Why? Because a sinful man wants nothing to do with God. We didn't go searching for salvation. He came searching for us, didn't he? Think about it. You are dead in sins and trespasses. A dead man can't do a thing, can he? Dead man can't make a decision. Dead man can't drive cars. Well, some of them, I think, are trying to. But anyway, right? It's, if you can't do anything because you're dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah, you're walking around. You're the walking dead, right? You're walking around, but God says one day, wake up, look. And the Holy Spirit says, open your eyes and see. Come, all who are thirsty. Come, right? Then he starts inviting us in. Doesn't he? Come, come on, come on. You see? You believe? Open his eyes, and, get, and God even gives us the faith to believe what we're seeing, believe it or not, right? He's even offering that opportunity. He, he offers salvation to man in that way, and then he says, Come, everybody, for what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that what? Only the Baptists that believe will get saved? No. Whoever believes will be saved. So when I stand on that kind of verse, I can't say that God predestined some of them to go to hell. God wants all to be saved. The Bible continually repeats that over and over throughout all the Gospels. Everybody, God wants everybody to be saved. Not everybody will be saved. What happens to those who reject the Gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it because they were chosen to go to hell? No. They were chosen to be saved, but because they rejected Christ, they made their decision. And God doesn't send anybody to hell. They do. I've heard that so many times. Oh, God's a good God. He won't send nobody to hell. And I'm like, God doesn't send anybody to hell. You do. You choose. God's opened a great salvation to all mankind. He said, come on, all who will receive me, come on. Everybody who wants to come in, come on. And what does man do? Mm, we like playing with sin. We love our darkness. We don't want to go into light. And they turn and walk away, and God says what? Okay, I'll let you. He actually gives you what you will, what you want. And then when that person dies, let me tell you something, he's going to give him what he wants there for eternity too, separation from God. You didn't want me while you walk in this earth, you're not going to get me after this earth. You will be separated. We call that eternal hell, eternal damnation. Absolutely, separation from God. We can't imagine, we can't fathom what that would be like separated from God, can we? Because he's in us, he's with us all the time. Not even lost man on this earth right now can fathom separation, total separation from God because God is around influencing everything that even lost man is doing. They don't understand what it's going to be like when God finally pulls the church off of this earth. When he withdraws his offering of salvation the way he does now through grace, right? When he withdraws that, he withdraws himself from the presence of this earth to let Satan rule and reign. He, when that happens, the earth's going to say, something's wrong. Those left behind, those who do not believe in Christ, they're going to say, something's kind of wrong here, man. Evil's just everywhere, but I never felt like this before. Well, that's because God was everywhere, right? 
except now he's not in that, in that great and glorious day, what we call a great and glorious day. So when you look at this and say, look, God chose you from the beginning of time to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through the fact that you've got to believe in Jesus Christ. If you accept the Son, you have eternal life. If you reject the Son, you have eternal death, right? Because you didn't walk into life. Holy Spirit wakes us up, shows us, opens our eyes to see, and then we make that decision. But I, I firmly believe because there's so many other verses that God gives everybody that opportunity. He gives every human being that opportunity. Doesn't matter what race you are, doesn't matter what you are. If you're Muslim, he gives Muslims that opportunity, right? Amen? Even other religions, he gives them a chance to believe in him and to receive him and to receive his son. So we don't want to get too far off on that and say it's just, you know, God's got it all planned. He made some human beings just for hell. No. That's really a Jewish mindset is what it is. Because in the days of Jesus, <clears throat> even before Jesus, what did Jews think of Gentiles? We were just fire for hell, right? We were fuel for hell. God invented Gentiles just to send them to hell. That, that was their mindset, that that's all Gentiles were good for. And then what happens? Jesus comes along. He starts straightening up some of them. You just saw it in some of this movie. He starts straightening up with the Jews going to the Samaritans first, whom they hated worse than Gentiles, Right? and saying, these people are coming in. And then later on, as we all know, the gospel started spreading, and these Gentiles started going. God reached down and chose Paul, Saul of Tarsus, right? Chose him to be what? The apostle to us, the Gentile. Get the message out there. I'm opening the door. I'm opening the doors. It's going to be called the church, right? And I'm going to bring in Gentiles after Gentile after Gentile into my kingdom. <clears throat> and then the scripture says, and when the last one has been saved, that's supposed to be saved, he's going to shut her down, just like that and go back to plan A, <laughs> right? The church was a mystery, folks. We need to understand that, that we are a mystery in the Bible. The, the Old Testament prophets couldn't see us coming. They knew something was there, but they couldn't see it clearly, that the church was coming. All they saw was straight Jesus coming, born into the world, going straight into the millennial kingdom, and, Ju and Judaism, being, or, uh, the Jews being raised up to rule and reign, to, to reign with him. They didn't see the church coming. They didn't see the, all the Gentiles being added into the kingdom of God. And none of them saw that, so it was a mystery to them. <clears throat> the point is this, in this situation, God chooses those who will get saved, and he sanctifies that work through the Spirit, and he calls them through the gospel. He says, and Paul says in 14, he said, He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice that. He called through their gospel. God's called these people through what gospel? Paul had already gone and preached. Jesus what? Alive, crucified, resurrected. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Came through the Virgin Mary. It's summed up in just that quick. Came through the Virgin Mary, was raised up, uh, grew in the admonition of the Lord, grew in knowledge and wisdom as he grew up as a child. That's why we don't have a whole lot about him in his childhood and teenage years. And then he was crucified for the sin of the world, put in a tomb, rock sealed off, Roman guard. God raised him from the dead on the third day, and he's now where? the right hand of God, interceding for us, his body, his church, right? That is the gospel message. What's the rest of it? He's coming back, right? He's coming back. We're anticipating the next move, the next form of prophecy in our life, which is sky opening up, and here he comes. We're waiting for a sound. We're not looking for a sign, are we? Here he comes. Boom, trumpet of God. Here he comes. That's the next big prophecy is about to be fulfilled. He's coming for his church. It was prophesied, told before, this is the way it's going to be. Jesus told his disciples, said, I'm going back to the Father, but I'm going to come get you. He told them, now get out there and win the rest of the world. Win all you can. Tell them about the gospel. Tell them everything I've taught you. Observe everything I've taught you. He told the disciples that. He's telling the church that in 2022. Amen? Tell them all there is. Tell them all there is, all you know. Tell them about the gospel. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. And with that idea of coming back is also the idea of I'm holding you accountable. I'm holding you accountable for what I told you to do. <laughs> Ouch, right? I'm holding you accountable, church. I'm holding you accountable, Peter, James, John, all you guys. I'm holding you accountable to get out there and do what I told you to do right before I raised up into these clouds. And right before that, right after that angel told them, what y'all looking at? Get out there and get doing it. You know, he told them, what, he, same way he went up, he's coming back in the cloud. Suddenly, boom, there it is, right there. We will look up because our redemption will draw nigh and we will see him coming. We will see him coming. 
So in verse 14, he said, He called you through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you right now, God doesn't share his glory with flesh, does he? He's not going to share his glory. He's not going to share heaven with flesh and blood. But we're going to be glorified. We're going to be changed. But we will share the glory that what Jesus gives us because we have given ourselves to him. We have surrendered to him. He's made us a new creation. <clears throat> that glory is not yet seen. Some of you may think it is. But, uh, and, and bits and pieces of it may be seen here and now in our lives, how he changes our lives. But that glory is yet to come. That glory is yet to come when he has glorified this where it will be with him in heaven. It will be with him for eternity. That kind of glory, sharing that kind of glory with God, <clears throat> with Jesus Christ, is guaranteed to those who have believed. He said, will you call to this through our gospel? You believe the gospel, and we might share in the glory of Jesus Christ. That glory, how are we glorified? Number one, the believers glorified with Christ is an heir of God. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You know what that means, right? We inherit everything he inherits. Ouch, right? Yeah, exactly, right? How do we gain that? How do we earn that? We didn't. We surrendered to it. You surrendered to it. Heir of God. And the, in Romans 8, 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're God's children. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. Have you shared in his sufferings? We will. Or we have. Or we will again. Somehow or other along the way, you will share in his sufferings and also share in that glory. <clears throat> the believer will be given a glorified body, just like the body of Christ. The back that up with Philippians 3.21 says this, Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we, so they will be like his glorious body. We will be transformed. We will have the body he had when he came out of that grave. A different body, a body that operates, it's still visible, it's still functional, but it operates in a whole different realm, doesn't it? Because when Jesus came back, he could just appear in rooms. Didn't have to open the door, did he? he had, you remember the stories, right? Suddenly appeared, suddenly there, cloaked himself this way, cloaked himself that way where they couldn't recognize him or whatever, blinded these eyes, opened these eyes. The, the body would be made different for us. It will be ready to share in his glory and in, in eternity with him. Um, We'll be glorified by uh, Christ by appearing in the glory of heaven. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We will appear with him. You know, as Thessalonians says, when he comes back, who's coming back with him? All those who are going to be reunited with their body that's been buried in the ground. Those of us who are left will be what? Caught up. But all those people will be coming back with him on that day he comes to get the church because he's going to resurrect those bodies out of the grave. All those bodies from the church age to this age, from the very beginning of the church to this age, boom, you talk about an earth-shaking event, right? They're coming out of the ground, folks. They're going to be reunited with themselves and be glorified in body just like our body. They're going to be in that situation, be in that form again. And if you will, I say form, it's not like they're not in that form now. But they're going to be reunited with it because that resurrection was guaranteed to them. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important to us because without it, we're just spinning our wheels, folks, right? Without it, we're just spinning our wheels doing church thing here. This is useless. But because of the resurrection, this is very meaningful that we come, we honor him, we glorify him, we sing praises to him, we give, we give our offerings to, unto him, we, we give our lives unto him after leaving this place, coming in here, getting refreshed, getting renewed, stepping out of here and getting out there in the dirt of the world, but yet shining light out there in the midst of darkness. That's your calling. That's what God's looking for out of you in 2022, amen? Just shine that light, buddy. Shine that light out there in the midst of all that darkness. So we see that he is, uh, we're going to appear with him in glory. Uh, Colossians 3, 4, Christ, when Christ who is our life appears, we also appear with him in glory. We'll also be glorified with Christ, receiving a nature of glory, a glorious nature just like the nature of Christ. Now, understand this in Romans 8, 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That glory which is coming, you're going to forget about all the present sufferings you've ever been through. You know? It's like, I don't know how they're going to work, you know, but you're, you're, you're going to, it's going to be so much better in that situation than it ever was here that all the pains and sufferings of here Dis, just dissipate. They're going to go away because you'll be in the glory of Christ at that time. He said also here, he said the believer will be glorified with Christ by receiving eternal glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Many of us don't like to suffer. Many of us don't like to be uh, un uncomfortable, if you will, in our life here on this earth. We're, we're a lot different. Maybe it's because we're American Christian. We're a lot different than the first century Christians. For Paul, he considered it what? Joy. He considered it a privilege to suffer for Jesus Christ, didn't he? I, I, I can't wrap my head around that, right? I can't. Because we are such a generation of comfort, quick endings, you know, got to have it now or last week or whatever. We don't wait. We, you know what I'm saying? We have been conditioned in our response to things that are so odd against the way God does things in our spiritual life, right? We always think he's late, don't we? Well, if God's late, but he's really actually right on time. You're the one that's over anxious. You're the one that needs it yesterday. You're the one that's not, not uh, patient, if you will. Oh, by the way, don't pray for patience, folks. It's, it's tough on you, all right? But anyway, ideas being that we are a generation of people that want instant gratification, and God says, wait, wait, wait on it. It's coming. Wait on it. And we have a hard time waiting. So uh, we need to understand that, that, that we'll be glorified in receiving a salvation that involves eternal glory. It's coming. It's coming. Our glorification, our day that, of, of that moment is coming, and we moan for it, we groan for it because our bodies are falling apart, right? We want that ultimate healing. We want that ultimate eternal body that God has for us, that eternal dwelling. It's, it's, as Paul would say, he said, I, I live here, I walk here, but I long to get to that city, that place where God is made for us. Amen? He said he went to prepare a place for us. I think he's not lying about it. I think he may be telling the truth, right? He's going to have a place prepared for us that we're going to love it. We're going to love it. And inside of us, whether we want to hang on to things of this earth or not, inside of us, we're like, ooh, let go of this stuff. Let's get on to glory, right? Let's get on to what God has done and what he's got ready for us over there. That's what we start thinking. So we believe it will be glorified with Christ to become a partaker in all the glory that will be revealed. 1 Peter 5, 1 says, The elders among you, I appeal as fellow elder, to witness of Christ's sufferings and one who also share in the glory to be revealed. There will be a glory revealed. We will share in it. Christ says, I'm going to share it with you. I'm going to share all of it with you. Why does he want to share it with you? Because we believed. We believed. And we follow him. We've surrendered to him. Anyone who believes and surrenders, I'm going to show you stuff. I'm going to show you glory. I'm going to show all this to you and reveal all this to you in the future. So we need to see that. A believer will be glorified with Christ upon receiving the light of the glory of God and will reign with him forever and ever. Revelation 22, 5 says, There will be no more night. They need no light of a, or a lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. A glimpse of what that will be like. Uh, I heard somebody say once before that so there won't be any shadows in heaven because <laughs> there's going to be light everywhere to where you won't even cast a shadow. You know, and I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds cool, doesn't it? It's like light everywhere. He's going to be that light on that great and glorious day for us. Now verse 15, moving on here. So brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. There's your encouragement right there. Stand firm. How many of y'all have had problems standing firm before? Yeah, the rest of you lying. Anyway, <laughs> right? Well, you had trouble standing firm. You knew how to stand. You knew what to stand for, and you backed out at the last minute because I just can't do it, God. I just, uh, and I'm not strong enough. But let me tell you something about that word right there, standing firm. When God gives a word like that, when he gives a command like that to stand firm, he's going to give you the power to do it if you lean on him. When we don't stand firm for God and stand firm in our beliefs, it's because we believe in our system rather than our God. We're not leaning on Him. We're trying to lean on a system. We're trying to lean on our own understanding. We're trying to lean on whatever it is about the flesh, whatever. And every time we lean on that, it's going to fail us every time. But when we lean on God, when we lean not on our own understanding, lean on Him and stand firm in our beliefs, stand firm in what we know, amen, then you'll be able to stand against anything. You'll be able to stand against anything. Remember what's happening to this church here in Thessalonica. He's saying, don't get too wishy-washy here. Stand firm on what? The teachings we gave you. Not what these Judaizers are saying. Not what these other guys outside the line of church work here. Not these folks coming in trying to twist stuff. He says, stand firm on the teachings we gave you. Now, I don't know if, if I'm in 
first church here at Thessalonica, whatever church it is they call themselves, the way. If I'm at the way church on a Sunday morning when Paul's there, are they taking notes or are they just doing this all by memory? <laughs> it's an interesting concept. Because we take notes, we, you know, we, we, some of you do. take notes and, and you got a Bible, you may be writing in the corners and all about what's being said and how it's being taught or whatever. And we have some things to refer back to. But what if you had no paper? What if you have nothing in your hand? How do you remember exactly what Paul told you? How do you do that, right? God's got to do that, doesn't he? God's got to put it, plant it in your head and make it stick, right? It's a, it's a proven fact. You won't remember probably 5% of what I'm saying today in 10 minutes from now. Right? <laughs> we just, it goes right over here, just right out there, in one ear and out the other. Some of it will stick. Some of it will stay with you for the rest of your life, what I'm saying right now. Some of you will be like, what did he preach about last week? I could probably preach the same sermon three times in a row. Most of you go, that sounds familiar, but, you know, I'm not sure. Right? <laughs> I mean, we tend to lose things like that. But in this situation, he says, look, hold on to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by the letter I sent you. In other words, he's saying, whatever that prophecy was that got y'all stirred up, throw it away. Throw it away. It's not godly. And I'm sure it was some kind of prophecy that Jesus has already come back and, you know, it's, it's a false. It's a lie. It's false news, right? He says, stick to what I told you. Stick to the letters I write you and you're going to be fine. And he says, and stick, stick with it. With uh, hold on to those teachings, whether by, um, uh, stand firm and hold on to those teachings. Uh, that firming, uh, firm stand is also to not sway back and forth to different doctrines. If, you, if you're in that situation in your life right now where your doctrines are still swaying back and forth, Lord help you. Amen? If you've been coming to church more than 30 years, you should be pretty well firm standing on the doctrines of God in your life. Amen? I mean, if you're not, you might need to dig a little deeper. Start looking at them because the doctrine, and when I say doctrines, and I'm not indoctrinating, but I'm saying doctrines of God uh, are, that, are that the Trinity, right? Some of the doctrines are that Jesus came born of the Virgin Mary. That's doctrinal, right? If you've got to have the basic stuff down, that's your foundation of your walk. There's other doctrines that are set, though, that God has set over the years. You probably studied them, read them in your book here. And Paul's saying that very thing. Stick to the doctrines I laid down for you. Stick to the foundations I gave you. And don't try to add all this other stuff to it. And see, we have to be careful today because if we go off chasing after this guy's book or that guy's book or the other guy's book about his book about the other book and not read the book, then it could mess your doctrines up. Amen? Even if it's a Southern Baptist writer, it could mess you up. Stick with the book. Not books about the book. Amen. That'll get you running all different directions there if you're not careful. Stick with the book. And that's what Paul is saying here. They didn't have the book back then. They had not had the canon of Scripture put together like we have. These folks are sitting in church listening to him explaining Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. That's all the Scripture they had. Paul's writing. Paul's putting this Scripture together by the Holy Spirit. He's starting to put it together to the churches. I'm not sure Paul knew that when he wrote the letter to the Second Thessalonians here that it would ever be in our Bibles, right? He is doing what God's telling him to do to that first century church. He doesn't have a clue it's going to go 2,000 years down the road, but it did. Why? Because it's God-breathed Word of God, isn't it? Came through Paul by the Holy Spirit, but it's still God's Word to the church. All these epistles that he wrote trying to encourage those churches. Here we are 2022 some odd years later and we're still being encouraged by words written over 2,000 years ago. Why? Because it's God's word, not Paul's word. When you read this book, understand the Holy Spirit inspired through those guys what to write. They didn't sit down and just write a bunch of stories thinking, oh, this will be a nice one to tell. This will be a nice one to know. The Holy Spirit said this, 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 and this. And he gave them what to write. And they penned it. They didn't author it. They pinned it down. The Holy Spirit is obviously the author of it. Jumped off on another one. Anyway, but the idea is, says, he says, uh, stick to it. All this passed on to you, word of mouth or by letter. And then he goes into 16 here, which is an interesting thing. He goes into this, says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, he puts them together uh, in a way that I think is saying, you know, Jesus and God, they're one, Right? Jesus was God. God is Jesus. They're, they're one. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. They're one like that. And so he's, he's putting them together. May the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Now, again, what is Paul doing here to this church? He's what? Encouraging them, isn't he? He's trying to get them off of that 
false doctrine word. He'd get them off of that false prophecy word they heard and stirred them all up. He's settling them all down again, right? He's probably had Timothy there working with him too. He's settling them down and getting them to understand it has not yet happened, but could happen tomorrow. <laughs> he's, he's lining them up, getting them ready, getting them that anticipation. I guarantee you they anticipated as much as we do right now that it was going to happen the next day. Here they are just maybe 30, 40, 50 years old after this crucifix. He's showing them it could happen any moment. Paul thought it would. He wrote like he thought it would. He wrote like, all right, you and I, we could be caught up in the air. When he wrote that about that, the graves will be open first. They'll be come out. And then we who are left, when he said we, instead of they who are left behind, he said, it could be us, church, right here in the first century. He said, we who are left behind will be caught up to meet them in the air. It's interesting he put we instead of they, meaning those in the future, because he literally thought it was going to happen that day or that moment, any day, even in the first century. We can read it today, 2,000 some odd years later, and say we will be caught up in the air. It makes it pretty well prevalent for today, doesn't it? That we could be caught up in the air in any given moment. So he, say, he gives them a blessing here. He blesses them and says, look, uh, the Lord Jesus himself and God our Father who loves us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. He gave us salvation. How are we saved? For by what? Grace you are saved through what? Faith, right? Not of works, lest anybody should boast, right? I think he wrote that for Baptists, didn't he? Absolutely. We'd boast like I'll get out if we could, wouldn't we? But we can't boast about our salvation. We cannot boast about what God did for us. We can praise him. We can boast about God, but we can't boast about what we did to get it and earn it because we didn't do anything, did we? We didn't do anything but this. Okay, I receive it. I believe it. I receive it. That's all we did. No works, no cathedrals built, no nothing. No statues, nothing. Just, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need you, God. I need you, Jesus. And that's all we did, just receive it. That is grace, folks. <laughs> grace is obviously God's riches at Christ's expense. He, he slew Christ. He put him on a cross. He killed him uh, for our sin so that we could just say, I believe, I receive. No works necessary. Only work necessary is what? Believe, right? Jesus told him, said, this is the work. Because his disciples asked him, said, what works must we do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said, ah, believe. Believe on him and the one who sent him. Believe. Who is that? But Jesus Christ and God the Father. Believe on them and you will be saved. Believe on them and you will enter the kingdom. It's interesting here. He says, um, <clears throat> wait, I lost, I lost up my place there for a minute. Um, that part of the Roman road of salvation is that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. Believe in that heart that God has raised him from the dead. What? You're going to be saved. It's all about believing, confessing, right? That we are saved. Every one of us in this room went through that. We went through the belief process. We went through the confession process. And we are saved because we believe with all our heart, with all of our mind, all of our soul. And he saves us from the top of the head to the bottom of our feet, folks. You are saved. And it's interesting here as we look at salvation, we need to understand that it's in his hand. It's not in our hand. <laughs> Amen? The only thing we did... To, earn, to gain salvation, not earn it, but to gain salvation was to believe. And God put us in his hand. Let me tell you something. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is like being in the palm of God's hand. Nothing can touch you except through him, right? Nothing can harm you except God allowing it, God happen, letting it happen. Nothing can take you out of his hand. Nothing can what? Jesus said, thank you, Lord, you gave them to me, and, and thank you, Father, you gave them to me, and nobody can pluck them out of my hand. So guess what? Satan can't do nothing to you until God allows it. The enemy can't do anything to you unless God's allowed him. If he's whooping up on you and beating you up, you might want to go, what do I do, God? What, what's going on here? You know, have I got something in my life I need to repent of? What's going on? Why, why this, 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 this trial? Why this thing going on, God? And it's not wrong to question God and say, why? It's not, your, it's not that you're, you just want to know information. Because without information, you don't know which way to go sometimes on this thing. It may be you've done absolutely nothing wrong and God's growing you through tr diverse trials. Amen? He'll do that too. Y'all going to need to understand. He's a loving God, but he's not going to leave you alone and just let you sit there. He's going to get you growing one way or the other. He may allow things to come to wake you up again or to get you moving in a certain direction, but it's all in his hand. 
It's all in his hands. So Paul is encouraging here the church at Thessalonica. He's saying, look, y'all guys, hang in there. Stay with the word that I gave you. And, and he gives them a prayer at the end. says, Lord Jesus himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And notice he ends up with deeds and words. Because our salvation is not about just a belief. It's about action, right? It's about an action. Doesn't matter what, how old you are, what, how you served in the church before, or where you are, as long as you're still taking breath on this earth, you're in action. Amen? You are in action. You're on call of duty right there. You, you're still on call, folks. No matter how old you are, no matter what shape you're in, as long as you're breathing upon this earth, you're still on call. You're still on the call of duty for God. And because of that, you still got good works, good deeds, good words, right? It's still flowing through you, folks. Should be. It doesn't matter. Until the day he calls you home, you're still active duty. You're still in active duty. I'm, I, I can't, I, that's just the word of God. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. You're still on active duty until he calls you home. As a believer, and that believer's active duty is to what? Go tell. Go tell. Get that word spread out there. Draw them one step closer to the cross of Christ. 2022, draw as many as you can, folks. We don't have much time I'm telling you. Draw as many as you can. Get them one step closer. You don't have to close the deal. Just get them one step closer to the deal, which is salvation for them. You have the ability to do it. The Holy Spirit in you will do it if you will allow him. Amen? Get rid of the junk. Soul search yourself. Dig it out. Throw it out. Repent of it. Get rid of it. And let him fill you to the utmost. And then walk in that power. It's unbelievable, folks. Walk in that power. I encourage you on this first Sunday of the year, get ready, get going. Amen? Because he's got, a, he's got work for you to do. You're still in, enlisted in the army, folks. You're still in his army. You got marching orders. Yours are not the same as mine. Mine not the same as yours, but we all got them. We all got them. So watch for those orders. Listen for that order. Watch for it to take place in your life throughout this week, throughout this year, and move on it when you see it. Have a heart like a lion, folks. Go for it. Go for it. And he'll give you that strength when he does. Thank you for being here today. Let me pray for you guys. Let y'all go. And I'll see some of you this coming Wednesday night as we continue to study. Actually about prayer, if you want to come in and hear a little bit of that. Uh, prayer on Wednesday nights right now in the book of, uh, of Fundamentals of Our Faith. Amen. Let's pray. I hear the music, it's above.